happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice program. I'm your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Today we have a very special guest, Peter Shimazaki Dota, who is a member of the Variance for Peace Rook Okinawa chapter and the co-founder of Hawaii Okinawa Alliance. Pete's knowledge and advocacy work will assist our viewers to better understand important global justice issues such as indigenous people's rights, militarization, decolonization issues, and the human rights struggles for peace that the indigenous people of Okinawa are faced with. Geopolitically, Okinawa is key to the American-Japanese alliance and the heart of America's military presence in Japan. Who should the Okinawa territory belong to? The answer depends on whom you may ask. Beijing continues to claim that Okinawa territorial roots based on history from 1372. By that year, the Ryukyu Kingdom was paying tribute to the Chinese court. And Japan did not complete its annexation of the island chain until 1872. China also claims that the annexation of Ryukyu Islands constituted an invasion. Japan's defeat in World War II nullified the Treaty of Shimonoseki of 1895, by which the Qing court formally renounced its claims to the islands. Every story has many sides to it, and history provides us with additional information that undermines China's territorial claim over the Okinawan Islands. In 1609, the Japanese feudal law that conquered the Ryukyu Islands allowed the Ryukyuans to also pay tribute to the court in China. The other point to be considered in history is the Qing dynasty's identity. Even though the Chinese consider themselves to be the rulers of the Qing dynasty, the Qings did not share the same belief, especially during the early time of their ruling. At that time in history, the Chinese were viewed as foreign invaders. To make matters more complicated, through the Battle of Okinawa and the US military control of Okinawa from 1945 to 1972, the US current oil representation of the US military bases on the Okinawan islands continued to be responsible for Okinawan civilian deaths, injuries, and rapes as well as environmental damages in the oppression of the Freedom of Assembly and the press for the indigenous people of Okinawa, who are fed up with having to have their most human rights violated. The people of Ryukyu Okinawa self-identify self as indigenous people. The United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples ensures that indigenous people have the right to self-determination, free, prior and informed consent, the right to protect the environment, including the protection from hazardous materials, and the prohibition of military activities in indigenous territories. The people of Okinawa have never willingly provided their own lands to the U.S. Uh, to use for military bases, and they are not happy with the Japanese government for ignoring their collective will against the construction and the expansion of a new U.S. military base in Hinoko. The collective will and voices of the indigenous people of Okinawa will shown during the Okinawan electoral vote, yet democracy for the indigenous people of Okinawa is not being respected by the Japanese government. As a result, a strong indigenous movement against the U.S. military base expansion is growing in Okinawa. And on that note, I would like to welcome Pete to our program. Thank you so much for making the time to be here with us today. Oh, no, thank you, sister, for all you're doing in making this uh these kind of programs available to the people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, this is a joint effort, and uh, it would have not been possible without uh, having the people who really, you know, are in the trenches of uh, the metas, you know, to come and really talk uh, uh, the stories of the people, you know, that we are trying to support mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, share more of the highlights of what's happening. So, Pete, uh, before we start, uh, uh, can you give our viewers a little perspective uh, on your background? Uh, where does your family come from, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. how did you get involved with all of this? Yeah, why should I care about Okinawa, right? Okay, <laughs> great question. Uh, okay, well, first of all, I'm a product of Okinawan history. Um, my father was a Marine in the Battle of Okinawa, and as a Marine at 27 years, three wars, he was in Okinawa quite a bit, where he met my mother, who's also a survivor of the war. Um, so I am one of those byproducts of war. Um, and even deeper though, um, you know, I still have lots of family in Okinawa. Uh, my grandfather was a, um, he passed away, but he's a, he was a, a principal. And uh, one of the schools he taught at, uh, a jet fire crashed into it accidentally killing uh, children and staff. Um, so in addition to friends and family connection, um, it's also just humanity. 
knowing what I do know, having lived in Okinawa, bear witness on both sides of the fence, having a prior military service. Uh, it's my humanity, seeing um, not uh, just the compassion for the people, but also uh, how inspiring uh, the Okinawan people are, um, as well as other factors. I'm personally a, a Buddhist, um, which, uh, you know, is about compassion and wisdom, and so applied to Okinawa, it calls for action. Um, and then the last and probably most important thing is what um, Hawaiians call kuleana, or uh, Okinawa skibun, which is a uh, kind of a responsibility I've inherited, you know, being a product of uh, Okinawa, part of its legacy. And um, yeah, I have to have a responsibility to um, address these uh, past issues that continue to fester in the present and unfortunately in the future right now. Right, so like, it doesn't get more personal than that, uh, the fact that you are a second generation Okinawan uh, and also the fact that you were in the military. Mm -hmm. So you can see uh, both sides of this story uh, and perhaps have a very bipartisan view uh, both from the perspective of what's happening with the people of Okinawa now and historically, but also uh, from a military background. So, uh, so obviously you do care about uh, Okinawa. And uh, so how long have you been involved uh, with Okinawan issues and activism uh, here in the state of Hawaii and in Oda, uh, um, parts of the well, world? Well, in terms of Hawaii, so I've been here about almost 20 years now. so. I actually moved here from Okinawa with the intention to just go to grad school and head back and you know here I am. <laughs> so I'm almost 20 years later Hawaii has that effect. But um, I, uh, as soon as I learned about Okinawa, actually when I was using my G GI Bill in college and volunteering for community events that I came across a delegation from Okinawa. Um, actually it was sponsored by a Christian group and they were, this was in 93. And at that time I was uh, just learning all those things they don't teach you in high school, including um, what's you know what's the, really the agenda behind uh, the use of military force. Um, yeah, so I would say it was about ninety three, so you know, almost about so twenty five years. What did you learn then uh, that usually it's concealed from history classes, and uh, what has prompted you to say? Okay, I'm going to devote a part of my life, a big chunk mm. of it, not only to bring awareness uh, through education, but also through advocacy, mm. uh, to have the history and the, the rights and the voices of people of Okinawa um, heard. Well, that's a good question. I mean, it prompted me to one become a history teacher. You know, um, uh, quite upset that I didn't really learn in high school. I really should have learned from history. Um, so it entailed you know, going to Okinawa and just you know being with family and doing a lot of research because at that time there wasn't much uh, information in English. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of things I learned, uh, too much for the show, but I, I would say one of the biggest things that really had a, a yeah, major a example. Yeah, a major example would be okay. So as you know, I'm biracial, bicultural, and my father, being a Marine of 27 years would, uh, since I can remember, said, son, war is a part of life that's always been, always will be. And I was fed that narrative by, you know, mainstream society that um, war is an inherent part of life that, you know. Um, so two things, you know, one, when I used my GL and went to the university, I, I really researched that question, is human, are humans truly just inherently violent? And very long, very short. Uh, my thesis concluded based on you know evidence we had available that there is too many exceptions to say that all humans are inherently violent and more is an you know inevitable part of life. Uh, and then I moved to Okinawa, and where I could see an example of a culture that uh, reflected um, perhaps uh, the qualities of humans that allow us to evolve and uh, you know. Unfortunately, for better or worse, become masters of this planet as, um, you know, um, uh, naked apes. <laughs> you know, um, what I'm saying is that uh, what I learned in Okinawa, not just hist historically as well as in, in the present, is um, that it is possible for a society to live in peace. And in fact, it's in its best interest if they want to survive to live in peace with each other and with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tell us, uh, you know, like I've never been to Okinawa, mm -hmm. most of the people, you know, who watch our programs haven't been there either. Um, 
in Iran, we like we don't understand uh, you know the identity of the Okinawan people. Do they see themselves as you know like sovereign, you know, different from Japan culture and country? Do they see themselves as more indigenous uh, uh, identity? Um, and when you're talking about peace, uh, what? Is their philosophy and belief in how to carry on with their own lives in Okinawa? Okay, well, you're asking me a lot of questions yes. in one breath. I know we don't have to answer <laughs> all of that right now, you know, but uh, that just to kind of frame a little bit of the thought, you know, as we go, you know, right, forward right. with the, move, the, the, the program. Um, so rephrase because I'm I heard two questions and yes. so one well, more time. Answer me the questions okay. that you've had. <laughs> there you go. I have the tendency sometimes to just <laughs> go off the tangent and I'm like, oh, I got like one question with like ten parts to it. So okay, well you yeah. asked about the identity. Uh, in terms of uh, regionally, absolutely, Wata Uchinanchu. You know, we have a, a strong identity as all, all, most island people do, um, and uh, I, you know, nations, if you will. Um, However, it's more complicated having, uh, you know, being a colonized island uh, and colonized by more than one uh, culture, as you mentioned historically, Jap Japan and the United States. So um, as a consequence of colonization and the control of education system, which it's no different today, uh, Tokyo controls the entire education system and they, they actually pride themselves that the kid, the third grader in the most northern part of uh, Japan, in Hokkaido, to the most southern, they're on the same page in the same textbook, learning the same Japanese history, and so they don't learn their own history, unfortunately. Um, nor do they get to express it, you know, politically. So what I my what I'm getting at is, yes, there are uh, a significant percentage that have a very distinct identity as Okinawans or Uchinanchu or whatever island they're from. But on the other hand, um, and it, it varies with generation, from older to younger, uh, more people have been assimilated into to become Japanese. Mm -hmm. And um, that has had a significant impact um, on identity issues. And then to complicate it, if I just add one last thing, sure. is um, the Japanese government actually refuses to acknowledge that Okinawans are indigenous, despite all the you know historical record and uh, validation by the UN. Um, whereas, while well, and it's probably because they did acknowledge the Ainu, as indigenous people of Japan, um, and that's come with some consequences, you know, for the J Japan um, lawsuits and other suits. So um, they refuse to recognize them as indigenous people, even though there's no question they are. And so that complicates it, combined with the education that um, intentionally pits a national identity to uh, essentially ethnically erase the Okinawan people and their identity. Right. and to become assimilated as mainstream Japanese. So we're going to take a quick break, and uh, uh, we'll be right back, and then we're going to elaborate a little bit further on that, OK? okay. Great. Aloha. My name is John Waihei, and I used to be a part of all the things that you might be angry at. I served in government here and may have made decisions that affects you. So I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in to talk story with me and some very special guests every other Monday here at Talk Story with John Wahei. Come on in, join us, express your opinion, learn more about your state, and then do something about it. Aloha. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice. This is Beatrice Cantello, your host. And uh, we are back to a conversation with Pete and uh, Dr. And uh, we were just talking about the identity of the Okinawan people and how uh, difficult it's been, uh, not only for uh, recognition of the Japanese government, uh, that the, the Okinawa people are actually indigenous people, but also to teach a history as it should be. Um, so, Pete, uh, moving forward, uh, um, what is the real problem with Okinawa right now, uh, and how do the Okinawa people feel about it? Mm. Well, you know, 
often it's just framed as military bases, but what's missing is like, well, what's the problem with the military bases? And we can go for hours talking about them. We don't have that time, so I can just summarize. Um, it's a human rights problem. Uh, Okinawans are subjected to the threat of war every day. In fact, when World War II ended, it never ended in Okinawa. And, and on the contrary, they expanded the bases and never left. You know, that was 1945, here we are in 2017. Um, it's a matter of political rights. Consistently, Okinawans uh, in the local elections, um, vast majority have supported uh, some form of demilitarization, uh, between 70 and 80 percent, depending on. Uh, but in the span of the last 30 years, yeah, it's always been about 80, 80 to 70 percent, um, of which doesn't get recognized, um, despite what the people elect and why they elect people, um, the efforts to uh, demilitarize. Um, are always stymied by Japan and the U.S. Um, there's a geno cultural genocide going on, as we mentioned, um, the erasure of the identity. Um, for example, language. You know, that's um, the Ryukyuan languages are uh, endangered, highly endangered, um, as is the culture. Is there like any? Um Effort for the revival of there Okinawan is. language yeah. and culture yes. from the Okinawan's perspective in in a real history, like it happened uh, with Hawaii in the seventies. Not not to the flourishing of the Hawaiian language uh, Renaissance, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a, a small effort and it's growing. And actually, identity is actually taking a more um, center stage with the current governor in um, Onaga, who part of his um, campaign and including one of the issues that's, that we're going to talk about is the imposed construction of uh, a naval port in Henoko in uh, rural Okinawa. Uh, part of his campaign was, uh, you know, all Okinawa together. So this is not an ideological, it's not left, right. It's, um, in fact, the conservative and the, you know, progressive factions are united on this for, for different reasons. So, uh, you know, like, since we're going to be talking about uh, the U.S. Uh, militarization expansion, I know, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, you, could we have uh, the picture of uh, uh, Okinawa uh, train islands for our viewers to um, take a look at it? So we have the U.S. base in Okinawa. Um, you could see that uh, about... Um, 18% of the land is occupied by military facilities. Mm -hmm. That's not counting the air and sea space. Um, what's really significant about this, uh, to show the discrimination that's that behind this, is that Okinawa is really small, smaller than Kauai. And Okinawa is the big island, if you will, of, of the island chain. Mm -hmm. um, it's Despite being 0.6% of all of Japan landmass, uh, the host almost two-thirds of the U.S. military in the entirety of Japan. Um, so in other words, it's unwanted in Japan, the bases, so they put them in someone else's backyard, um, mm -hmm. namely in a, you know, a, an indigenous people they conquered. Um, Japan did give up their colonies in Korea and China from their expansion as an empire, but that's one that um, people have forgotten in history books is they never restored the Ryukyu Kingdom, you know, the, the sovereignty of the people. Right. So, um, so now there is a big push, uh, and it's almost in its final stages to get the expansion of the military base in Hinoko Bay. Now they um, actually started. They already construction, started yeah. the construction actually, this week, unfortunately. And uh, I am so sorry. And I know that prior to that, uh, there are several peace activists and human rights activists in uh, uh, Okinawa protested. Uh, so, like, can we have some pictures of, uh, um, you know, these moments so that uh, our viewers well, can have a... <laughs> well, that shot is funny because that is Henoko, and when you think of protests, you don't usually think of people dancing, but that would be Okinawa style. That's New Year's, watching the first sunrise. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one of many elders being accosted by Japanese uh, riot police. Um, they don't use the local police because they respect... As you can see, it's a... a a case study in civil disobedience, nonviolent resistance. Those are uh, everyday people uh, putting their bodies on the line to defend the land. Mm -hmm. uh, this picture I took actually, this was when Clinton was president. As you can see, it was very inspiring to see entire villages hold hand in hand and, and encircle entire military bases. Wow. That one right there is Kadena Air Base, the largest 
air base uh, in Asia. That's a recent rally. As you can see, this is not a, uh, a fringe group. You know, no, this no. is a, a main. This is the mainstream of the people who are united mm -hmm. uh, for self-determination and peace. Uh, that's an example of Asian Orange found at uh, Kadena School. One of the many problems uh, that the military either you know either unintentionally or intentionally cover up. Wow, you know, like, pictures of more than a thousand wolves, and uh, um, when you see uh, so many hundreds, thousands of people holding hands together in mm. peace, uh, asking to just have the right to mm. exist uh, um, and to be self sufficient uh, and uh, to have democracy respected mm. uh, in their own land uh, and not having that. Uh, and if I may, to have hard. just basic security, you know, that's mm -hmm. what's so ironic is uh, those that support the bases uh, tend to focus on is for the security mm -hmm. and or economic security. You know, like, oh, it's, so you know. let's elaborate a little bit of that. Like, so for those who are for military base uh, expansion and presence uh, in Okinawa, and their arguments are, look, it's for security of mm -hmm. the United States and also Japan. And if it's for economic uh, security, you know, of Japanese people, uh, give me a couple of examples. You know, what's the regular rhetoric that's being used? Well, you, you stated that. So uh, when you know they'll say China or North Korea, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, if that's the reason of having military in Okinawa is to prevent missiles flying over Japan or to prevent Chinese moving in the South Sea. Apparently it's not working, is it, right? Yeah. And so instead of being a deterrent, it's actually uh, acerbating tensions, um, mm -hmm. much the way um, Pu'uloa, a mayor known as Pearl Harbor, was attacked by the, their imperial competitor, Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't attack the people, they were focused on military targets. Um, so the issue of security in Okinawa is very grave, especially now with all this tension, because um, you know, there's many reasons why. Why are so many Okinawans, like, you know, opposed to militarism and this, this military preferation? Well, part of it is um, having survived so many wars. Uh, the Battle of Okinawa was the bloodiest land battle war, uh, in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Almost one in three civilians were killed. And so that's what, what modern warfare shows is that um, despite all the focus and worship of the military, of course, you know, which military you really focus on one nation, um, that the bulk of uh, casualties in modern warfare are actually civilians, as we saw in Okinawa. So um, it doesn't bring them physical security. Um, they survived off the land, I mean, historically, and then especially after the war. So they really depend on uh, the environment, the aina, and to survive. And so like, it seems like the Japanese government have concealed the environment uh, destruction and impact of having the military base expanded on Okinawa, like on the corals, on the fishing industry, and also the land itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that makes it really harder for the people of Okinawa to, you know, exist and, and carry on with their own traditional, um, you know, culture and cultivation of, of fishing. It's a very big part, a staple of their diet and yeah, their culture too. Absolutely, right? you know, there's endangered species like the dugong, but, um, you know, I want to get to another issue of security that people that argue for bases often do, and that's, you know, economic benefits. Just First of all, the, the argument that you should have military because it brings jobs, um, it, is, it's up there whether we should have, I don't know, selling you know, harmful drugs because it brings an income. You know, it's very harmful, there's another side to it. Mm -hmm. It's insulting for a, a culture that's historically been um, very peaceful. In fact, uh, during the Ryukyu Kingdom you mentioned, um, when it was unified, they actually disbanded their military because they were surrounded by Japan, China, all these uh, regional empires and so they realize oh we're done if we go to war with these huge nations so they um, found that the foreign policy was best done through ex economic exchange and cultural exchange and just maintain peaceful relations with your neighbors rather than the standing military and fast forward now we got the culture that's only it thinks that the military is the only way to have security and we see it not just bringing the region but actually the world in great danger you know of a potential mm -hmm. world war mm -hmm. um, but I just want to uh, point out very specifically what's interesting about the argument too is that they have found 
I'll make it short, that in areas of land that were returned to civilian commercial use have much increased the commercial output, much increased more jobs than the bases ever have. Mm -hmm. So the argument, I'm sorry, I'll just say this, like even the conservative you know, chamber of commerce type folks are also against the military because um, the not just the um, inefficient use of land, and it, it, it uh, really um, holds back the local economy and local planning and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, you can Very hard. So now uh, we are almost at the end uh, of our program, and uh, I would like to leave our viewers and you with uh, an opportunity to talk about uh, what can people of Hawaii or around the globe uh, could do to support the people of Okinawa, and uh, um, you know, since the military expansion is happening, and uh, there is a big cry, you know, for indigenous people's rights mm -hmm. to be heard and respected, and and protected, um, what would be that message? Well, I mean, the first thing is to be informed. So in terms of being informed, um, you know, the DQ Shimpo, there's some Okinawa newspapers, they might have some English sections, but um, our HOA, or Hawaii Okinawa Alliance, um, we have a Facebook page where articles are posted. That's probably the most, one direct way I can guide people to just sign up on there if they can to get information. But aside from just being informed, just caring to do something, and I know that's what you're asking about. Um, definitely, we need to hold our government accountable. Those are not Chinese military, it's not Russian, that's U.S. military. So we need to hold our, uh, our ourselves accountable and address our representatives. Um, and um, also, um, you know, we're just trying to pull together, uh, HOA is uh, uh, pulling together the Okinawa community and allies. Mm -hmm. So we have some events coming up uh, this Sunday. Yeah, this Sunday, there's one. On the 30th. At, story. Yeah, at the uh, Jiko and Hongwanji and uh, nice. Like Like and mm -hmm. School Street at 4.30. Um, I see yeah, you have yeah, some information there. there. Um, and then just keep posted. We have some more events coming up next month and some films coming up and so forth. Uh, um, yeah, I would like people to get in touch because we are making appointments with representatives, uh, federal reps, to address our concerns and mm -hmm. so forth, as well as holding the Japanese government also accountable. That's what makes it so complicated is there's two occupiers and they just blame each other yes. so they can get away with um, what's yeah, happening. Yeah. But uh, I think that the uh, better future you know, is coming forward. That's the good of the bad and the ugly of what we're seeing right now in the U.S. Uh, history and government is that more people are becoming aware, more civically engaged. Well, my darling brother, it was wonderful having you here uh, today, and I hope that this may be the first of many visits that uh, you have and that we can talk a little bit more in depth about uh, you know, all the aspects of Okinawa and the beautiful work that you do as an advocate and activist. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for being here and uh, to stay with us on uh, Global Justice, uh, uh, Perspectives on Global Justice. And uh, I hope to see you again uh, next Friday at 4 o'clock. Until then, uh, who we hope.